The way sound is reproduced hasn't really changed since the 1930s when the great Alan Blumlein invented stereophonic reproduction. And that sort of technology has been working in the whole business of sound reproduction since those times, getting on for a century. My name is Marcos and I am one of the founders and CTO of Audiocynic. I was in Spain, I was working in video engineering because I was helping my dad with um, many productions that he was working with his company. And then I was at the point is like, uh, where should I do films or should I do that? And I applied for the, um, a master's in University of Southampton because I wanted to do sound vibration and here there were a team of experts working on active noise control. I'm Filippo Fazzi and I'm the chief scientist of Audiocynic. I spent most of my professional life at the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research at the University of Southampton. And I've always done research in, in audio and loudspeaker array and microphone array. In 3D sound, it's the signals you want at the listener's ears. So, for example, you had a source over there, it'll produce a sound there before it produces a sound there. And therefore, if you can generate with some loudspeakers in front of you, some sound there before it arrives there, uh, the brain will perceive the sound as coming from over there. 3D sound is how we hear in reality. Everything else is a compromise. And the magic is that you can create, uh, for example, the feeling of someone whispering on your ear, someone talking behind you, an aircraft passing above you, just with a small loudspeaker array in front of you. Because in the end, all that matters is that you deliver the correct audio signal to your left and to your right here, and that you adapt that depending on how you move your head. Once I listened to the first implementations that they, they had in University of Southampton on this technology, I said, well, this is great, this is magic, you know. But that's what we are, illusionists. This technology had a problem, which is that um, you had to sit static in front of the soundbar if you wanted to have this effect. And then we were saying, oh, this is not really practical because I don't know of anybody. I wouldn't buy that product, you know, for example. But everybody knew that the so-called sweet spot is an issue. In other words, if you're sitting in one place, everything works perfectly. But as soon as you start moving your head, which is something that we always do, then the illusion starts falling apart. But the real change happened when we started combining acoustics with computer vision. What Marcos and Filippo did, uh, which moved the field quite a lot further forward, was actually be able to track the listener's head using image processing. And I remember I went back running to the, to the office. To my, I was in the lab, went back running to the office, and I told to my office mate that was, this was like eight in the evening or something like that. And I told him, oh, man, it's working, it's working, it's working. Well, I was so happy, you know, that it was finally working because I knew that this would crack many things. Considering that audio is such a difficult beast to tame, when you first hear that it works, in spite of all the mathematical, physical challenges, it is a, wow, is that really possible? And what you hear is the proof that, yes, it is. The demo was very good, you know, and then everybody that was listening to the demo, and the demo was getting uh, always better. But then in January 2017, we went with one of our prototypes. We put it in CES, Ruben Wilcock, which is the, the guy who you know, founded Future Worlds. He was the one who brought us to see it, you know. He was the one who really made us realize about what the world wanted. You know, we went from the lab, see yes. That was, I was a him really. All the guys from Future Worlds were helping us a lot with the demo. And you know, see is 200,000 people. And one person coming and telling us, wow, this is the best demo I've seen in the show so far. Consumers are saying that they want this technology, we just need to figure out how to give it to them. There are some subtleties to it, and it is technically complicated. My experience has been that it, it, it's quite a long lag between the basic science and the, the, the commercial uptake. Well, I had to do many challenges. First of all, from a company point of view, have the company funded and have money to really develop all the taking it from a, from a lab prototype to actually putting it in a commercial chip that will go into a product. Finding the right clients at the right time is partly what it's about, I think, and people who will embrace the technology. Sometimes it takes access to some of the senior people, the real decision makers, to actually make things happen. You can get enthusiastic engineers who think this is great, but actually getting it into the people who make the decisions in a company is sometimes a challenge.
I think there's also a challenge of having to do a huge amount of the work for yourself for quite a long time before you can raise the funding or get access to the people and resources needed to outsource some of that stuff. And I think that's a really tough time that uh, you know, entrepreneurs have to push through. Back then it was basically me doing everything, you know, programming, making the prototypes, talking with customers, making presentations, traveling, and now I've been able to focus in much more on, on developing the technology and I have had a tremendous help in, in the commercial part. A person that was very important was Lee Thornton from IP Group, okay? So Lee was there. I remember the day I met Lee and, and he came to the lab at the university and he saw the technology and I think he said, wow, this is cool, yeah. We said we should do something with this and I remember him making lots of questions and being interested and then it took us some time to, to work with him because I think Philip and I were scared of investors but dearly, you shouldn't be scared of investors, they want the same as you. One of the things I didn't know, you know, for example, that's why when our, our CEO David, he, he helped a lot, is in understanding the dynamics of this industry, the consumer electronics industry, okay, where you have some um, networks that are very obscure, you know, you don't know how to navigate them, you don't know how to arrive to the right person, you know, so that they actually like your product, you know, and it takes lots of effort and it takes a uh, lot of, um, you know, many trips, many trips to Asia to meet with the right uh, key stakeholders, you know, giving your ideas in the right way for them to use. So the right, the right way is not a prototype, you know, like the one we could build at the university with all of the self components. You need to give them things in a, in a package way so that they can actually take it. These are things we didn't know. My name is David Monteith and I'm the CEO at AudioScenic. There, there are a lot of different risks, I think, in any startup. You've kind of got a bit of a tightrope to go along between all the different things <laughs> that, that can go wrong. Um, so there isn't really a single one that, that'll get you, because the one that'll get you is probably the one you haven't thought of. We just started pitching the day that the lockdown was announced in 2020 in the UK. So it was catastrophic. People didn't know what was happening, you know. During that time, we were uh, going through one of our main investment rounds. We were also working at some kind of commercial deals that we were hoping to close during that period. But that was a very difficult time for the world and definitely for Odyssey as well. All the investors kind of keeping their money close to their chest. Uh, companies were not so adventurous in trying to, you know, start in other things. During the initial stages of COVID, uh, we helped them to think long and hard about how COVID was going to inter interrupt their business model, uh, making it harder to travel to see potential customers in China, helping them understand how they need to, to extend their, their financing runway uh, to account for those delays, and perhaps rethinking some of the assumptions in their business model. It's our, it's our job, we need to finish it, we've started it. Also, I think working with, uh, with David, our CEO, that was very good. He was also very helpful, you know, in, in keeping pushing and making sure that uh, yeah, the whole idea flourish. From Audio Scenic's point of view, I think the timing is very good. We, we, have, um, we have a really good opportunity because of all the content that's around now and because the entertainment is becoming more immersive. And I think that because we've connected with good people, because of the support from the investors, because of my past experience, I think we're doing it the right way in terms of building the right things. So I think those, those two fundamentals we've, we've, got, we've got right. I think looking ahead, Audio Cynic's got a really exciting future. We see them right at the inflection point for uh, adoption of their technology, uh, signing their first licensing agreements, and we're seeing a lot of interest from uh, companies for multiple form factors and, and devices uh, wanting to embed Audio Scenics technology. It's the quality of the companies that are showing interest. The very fact that they're having the slide rule passed over them by those companies is, is encouraging. We have projects with some brands that I cannot, even, I cannot uh, disclose, but uh, yeah, there we are introducing gaming soundbars into the market this, this year. When I take a step back and look at how it evolved, from the moment when Marcus and I, sitting at a desk, press the button to create Audio Scenic with an initial investment of two pounds and then we had a shared a shared desk in a shared office and just 
a dream and a strong belief in our technology. And then when I see where we are now, uh, and I like to think it's still the beginning of the journey, uh, a company with more than 15 people, uh, you know, with employees in different parts of the world, about to release a product with one of the major international brands. That was an incredible journey. And as I say, I like to think it's still the beginning.